And welcome to our second conversation in this uh, Resves Opera Conversation Series. I will start with a few words of introduction about Yuval. But before that, I really want to thank you for, for accepting our invitation. I'm sure it will be a pleasure and it's definitely an honor to have you with us. Um, this conversation will last about an hour. Uh, Luis and I prepared a few questions and then we'll uh, leave the floor to other people also to participate. Uh, I also want to say that I'm very curious about the questions that Luis might ask you, Yuval, considering that Luis Soldado, I will also to mention this, is himself not only a musicologist, but also in fact, primarily a, a composer uh, whose work is not without affinities with, with yours. So I'm also very curious about that too. It's so I guess, I guess that in Thank this you. context, um, um, Yuval Sharon needs but a very short introduction. We know your, your work already. Yuval is one of the most innovative opera directors in the US, if not in the world today. Uh, the founder and artistic director of the industry, a LA-based contemporary opera company, and the recently appointed artistic director of Detroit's Michigan Opera Theater. He was also the first American to stage in Bayreuth, a uh, production of Lohengrin, which I had the opportunity to experience two years ago. That could be the topic of a different conversation. Um, yes, but, for sure. Yes, of course. Um, <laughs> but I think it's, you are first and foremost known for your work with the industry. So your unconventional productions, many of them are site specific, include Opscotch, in which both singers, musicians and spectators were driven in limousines to specific locations in LA before they gathered in the central hub. Uh, Invisible Cities, an opera by Christopher Cerrone, which in, in your production took place at the Union Station, also in LA. And more recently, uh, Sweet Land, an exploration of colonialism staged in the park, uh, whose run was cut short, if I'm not mistaken, by the pandemic lockdown in March. Um, Although we'll certainly uh, talk about your previous work in this conversation, our focus today will be uh, Twilight Gods, your latest work and the very first production you presented in Detroit, which I think can be briefly described as a drive-in adaptation of Wagner's Twilight of the Gods, with audiences driving through the theater's parking garage and hearing the music in their radios while watching the performers uh, live. So this setting allowed you to circumvent the problem of having many people inside the theater, a problem that, as we all know, has impacted uh, the opera world uh, over the previous months. Um, so to get to my first question and also give you the opportunity to show uh, the material you gathered for this presentation, and thank you for that. Um, um, if we look at Twilight Gods against the background of what is happening today to opera so during the pandemic, we would say what an ingenious production, uh, ingenious because it circumvents, it solves the problem posed by the pandemic in both a creative and effective manner. And in that sense, somehow epitomizes the situation we are going through. Um, on the other hand, if we know a bit about your work, we would also say this is a very recognizable Yuval Sharon production. <laughs> the very kind of production uh, one would expect you to, to present. So I guess my first question is, um, would it be fair to say that the pandemic was not only an obstacle, but also an opportunity or even a pretext for you to present something really innovative in your first production in Detroit, something that you would like to do regardless of the pandemic? <laughs> yes. That is a, it is a difficult question to answer, um, but I think it does get to the heart of what theater is in the end all about, you know, in the, if, when you, when you really boil it down, you're always uh, responding to an environment and you're always responding to the time that you're in, regardless of whether it's a classic work or a brand new work. And uh, of course the pandemic required us to respond in ways that maybe, none of us quite anticipated. So I wasn't sitting on the idea of a drive-in um, go to demo room, just waiting for something like a global pandemic to strike so that I could actually perform it. Um, but in, it, it really was an idea that arose out of the, opportun uh, the opportunities of the moment, as you said. I mean, opportunities 
maybe is the wrong word just because it might seem like it's taking advantage of the moment. It's actually quite the opposite. I think that the pandemic did uh, force all of us to think about why does opera why does opera still matter right now? Why, why do we still perform opera? Why do we look to, uh, in, in America, it was, uh, you know, ha has a, a whole bunch of other uh, issues related to it in terms of um, social justice, in terms of the uh, uh, racial justice that we're, that a lot of opera companies are, are thinking about right now. Um, you know, the pandemic uh, and, and the quiet of the pandemic for most opera companies uh, was twinned with Black Lives Matter and and everything related to the the, the murder of George Floyd and mm -hmm. Breonna Taylor um, and everywhere in American culture and I know also uh, internationally this notion of what it means to uh, represent stories uh, in on stage on film but opera I think pri particularly became. Uh, uh, a lightning rod for thinking about how uh, how people of color have been represented on the opera stage over many years, and and for me that led to a bigger question of why do we do opera in America when uh, when so much of the opera is still these relics of colonialism, uh, the the notion that the majority of opera that happens in America is still from the German, French, English repertoire. Um, and the number one opera that performed in 2019, I think, was Barber of Seville uh, in, in America. So you think to yourself, wow, OK, um, is there a is is opera still just this kind of holdover? Uh, is does it is it this last holding place of an inferiority complex that America has in relation to Europe? Uh, I, I have been in my work with the industry, been advocating for uh, uh, opera as a genre that could still be an emerging emerging genre, one that is truly uh, an American genre in its way. Um, mm -hmm. But Twilight Gods to me signaled something different because the pieces that I did with the industry were all brand new works with composers and, and librettists writing alongside me as we develop, you know, as, as, as I, if I came up with a kind of the concept of an opera that took place in cars, the composers and writers were then elaborating on that concept, taking it further, uh, making it their own so that we would create this kind of um, highly collaborative uh, work uh, that that was all of one piece. Uh, Christopher uh, Sarone's opera, uh, Invisible Cities, uh, it, in a similar way, um, Sweetland absolutely was something that that all came together in, in, uh, in, in, in as one piece. Twilight Gods was something different. And I think that was a response to the, to the pandemic in a way. Uh, the idea of creating a world premiere under these circumstances seemed really, really difficult. Also, um, as I was in discussions to take over the artistic directorship of, um, of Michigan Opera Theater, you know, I'm dealing with a, a company that um, has certainly done new work, but has a different kind of responsibility to the classics. And, mm -hmm. you know, this, 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 I, you know, th th this moment really made me think, could these classic works, what could these classic works still tell us? What could they uh, actually, how could they actually speak to the moment uh, in ways that maybe we haven't let them do in previous iterations? And a piece like Goethe Demerung, Twilight of the Gods, I do feel like we are living in uh, this opera right now. Like this is the moment for an opera like Goethe Demerung, which is this notion where uh, the, the, the past is weighing so heavily on these characters that the only thing that can be done is a kind of uh, immolation. Um, this notion that we have to burn all of these pre-existing structures to the ground, not as an act of pure destruction, but as an act of uh, regeneration. Uh, thinking about uh, the world we're living in is hopefully a kind of a, a phoenix that needs to be uh, uh, burned to ashes so that something new can emerge. And as we were developing Twilight Gods in September and October, that was in many ways the only way to have hope for the future was to think that all of these structures, um, social structures, political structures, and even artistic structures are unraveling in front of our eyes. And the, the hope is that uh, they're unraveling so that we can think of something new, uh, something new might, might emerge from it. And that's very much the story of Goethe Demelon is at the end of a, of a four opera cycle, it doesn't have the purity and pristine quality of Rheingold, the first opera, where the the, the musical themes, where the, the ideas and the scenes, 
in retrospect, almost have a kind of naivete, almost have a kind of fairy tale aspect to it. And as they, as the opera moves on, as the characters and history takes on more and more weight, you get to the world of Götterdämmerung, where all the musical themes are so layered on top of each other, in in a way that feels like it's, it's on the verge of breaking. And then it does, thanks to Brunhilde, that she at the end is the one that burns all of it to the ground to create a sense of a new beginning. Um, and and uh, it really it really did seem to me like like the opera of the moment. And um, and uh, more importantly, because uh, I have to say that the city of Detroit and a parking garage in Detroit, uh, this kind of empty uh, concrete shell also felt so much like, uh, like uh, you know, in, in an ideal world that would be a set for a production of Go to Demogol <laughs> anyway, you know? Do, do you want to show us a few pictures of yes. the production? I think, I think it'd be to. great. Yeah. Give me one, for, give me one. Yes, absolutely. So uh, let me give you a sense of, okay, so oh, let me try this now. Okay, so this is actually, when we were in conversations, you know, I was in Los Angeles when the, when the, when the shutdown started. And so, you know, and I'd only been to Detroit once. Um, I had to ask the, the company in Detroit to, to uh, Michigan Opera Theater to tell me a little bit about, about what was close at hand for them, because clearly this was a moment of resourcefulness uh, and thinking about what, what, uh, what, what does the company possess as, as assets that we could then uh, deploy as safely as possible. Um, they had mentioned their theater that the Michigan Opera Theater opens that owns and operates their own uh, uh, their own theater, um, which is rare in, in America. Actually, a lot of times it's it's the theaters are leased from from counties or or other governmental uh, uh, organizations. Uh, but of course, no one's going into a theater right now, so that's not much use. But also rare for Michigan Opera Theater is that uh, we own our own parking uh, center, and it is a seven story uh, parking structure. Um, that is shaped like a double helix. And so the cars can drive up and then drive down and exit a different direction. And uh, I, I actually thought to myself, well, you know, if we can't be in the theater, why don't we turn the parking center into a theater? Um, thinking also more importantly about this notion of how do we keep audiences and artists safe during the pandemic? And of course, one, one really easy way to do that uh, is to keep everybody, keep audiences at least in their own cars. And so that's where this really began. And I sat in my um, set right here in Los Angeles and kind of drew this kind of map of what this might look like. Of course, it was clear that we were gonna end on the roof and, um, and uh, really thinking that from the roof, we could, it could be a great platform for, uh, for uh, uh, the immolation scene, the final mm -hmm. scene of, of, of Brunhilde's. But if you follow this map, I was imagining that we were out in the surface a lot at that point, I was thinking a live singer or performer would be introducing the piece. Uh, for, for anyone that doesn't know the opera, uh, you know, it's normally six hours long. Um, we were not going to do all six hours of, of Goethe Demolong in this kind of situation. Okay. Instead, uh, we started thinking, I, you know, I started thinking first about like what scenes would make the most sense uh, to depict, to give um, one strand of, uh, of this opera to the audience. Um, also, you know, we were not going to be able to get a, a 70 plus orchestra uh, in this parking center. So very early on, I worked with uh, the composer and arranger Edwin Dells to create new um, adaptations of each of these scenes. And uh, what ended up happening was a kind of an ascent through the parking center, also in terms of the number of forces, musical forces, so mm -hmm. that as, as you moved up the, the musical, the, the sounds of the opera, um, grew more and more. This is kind of how it how it looked. Uh, and of course, you might notice my um, my very important note there that says not to scale. <laughs> so just in case anybody was concerned, uh, but it, it, if you follow the green arrow, that is kind of how I was imagining this this geographic ascent through the parking center as an experience of the opera of Goethe Demolung. So this is where it started, and let me show you some pictures of how it ended. Instead of a live performer, what we ended up having was a, um, uh, a video presentation of, of sort of just the, the brief introduction to all the characters. And it gave us a chance to already see, uh, in this case, Christine Gerke as Brunhilde, be introduced to her as a character right from the beginning um, so that we didn't only see her once all the way at the top and, and so that we could build in the sense of what the narrative of the opera is. 
Um, from there, audiences left the, the surface lot and they moved uh, from level to level. Uh, on each of the different levels, uh, the audience had to tune into a different radio frequency because um, if you, um, I'm gonna actually go back briefly to this. Um, uh, an important uh, aspect here, if you see my, oh, my arrow's gone. Oh, okay. Uh, well, uh, if it, those, those little cars that you see on the surface lot, when they went up to level one to see uh, Valtrauta, a new group of eight cars parked for the prologue and watched that scene while uh, scene one was happening. Then see, those groups of cars moved up a level. A new group of cars came in at the surface lot. And now we had two scenes, we had three scenes basically happening simultaneously. That continued until a new group of eight cars came into the prologue. And now we had, uh, you know, uh, four uh, simultaneous scenes happening. And this continued over and over again until uh, at a couple moments uh, during a performance, we would have all of these layers, all of these seven scenes basically happening simultaneously with each other. And I have to say for me, uh, as, as, as a great lover of, of John Cage, I happen to uh, really enjoy just wandering through the parking, uh, wa walking through the parking center and hearing all of the scenes of Gotcha Demolong happening somewhat simultaneously, but but kind of echoey depending on where that happens. So uh, that was uh, that was one of the uh, uh, one of the aspects of this project that, that unfortunately I couldn't share with almost anybody else. But <laughs> but the audience experienced it sequentially. The singers ended up doing their scenes. Um, uh, uh, it was twelve times a day. Uh, always for a new group of, of audience members. So now moving back to this, that's why we had a different radio frequency on each level um, so that the, the audience has always heard only uh, the sound from that particular scene. They first emerged, uh, at, turned a corner and saw Valtrauta. Uh, in this case, we also had a super playing uh, Votan, who you see here. And Valtrauta's scene, um, you know, all of the scenes had to be timed to the same exact length, which mean that, meant that each scene was cut a bit. Uh, the emphasis here on Valtrauta was uh, her very beautiful uh, 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 narration in act one about the current state of, of Wotan, Brun Brunhilde's father. And she told it as, you know, we kind of reframed it as if this is her motivating herself before going to see Brunhilde as to uh, think, okay, I I've got to do something about this. I've got to tell my sister about this, the sad state of the gods. Um, she was accompanied by one solo cello. Normally again, 70, 70 plus orchestra reduced to just that one cello, um, I think worked so beautifully in terms of the intimacy. Uh, it was as if, I think one, one um, commentator uh, had mentioned that it was as if she was um, uh, singing a duet with a Bach cello suite, uh, uh, which I thought was uh, exactly in a way the, the, the idea. Um, the audience, uh, if this was the first scene you saw, you would move then to the next level. You saw both Albrecht and Hagen. I don't have one really good picture overview of it, but they were divided by a concrete barrier, um, Albrecht on one side and Hagen on the other. And the two of them were uh, accompanied by three instrumentalists. Um, um, this fantastic scene uh, of act two, uh, scene one of Goethe um, uh, the, the The timbres for this were electric, ba electric bass guitar, uh, bass clarinet and accordion. And so the entirety of Wagner's orchestra reduced to those three uh, really, really uh, compelling, uh, compelling uh, sonic voices. And in this case, this was a scene, um, this was an important scene to depict in terms of this notion that we have the scene of, of, uh, of a father and son and a kind of generations of hatred. This notion that in, in this last part of the ring, we are seeing both Hagen and Siegfried as these, uh, as these characters who uh, are almost unwitting, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're being uh, manipulated by these previous generations. They, they have no free will of their own and are in a, in a way these kind of automatons. Siegfried is not aware of this at all, but Hagen is, is very heavy, it weighs very heavily that he has so little um, personal agency in this, in his own life, in his own, in his own world. And, and this notion that the past continues to haunt uh, and shape the present is something that I think was, was so masterfully captured by these two singers. And I think the ghostly sounds of this, of this trio. Uh, oh, here's another. This gives you this actually this picture gives you a little bit of a better sense of this. It's Hagen here, 
and the, this real brutalist architecture of this concrete, uh, uh, <laughs> the garage, you see this, the chicken wire on the left, and that's what divided uh, Hagen and, and, and Albrecht up. And um, I, I will say that, that um, this is an aspect that I was very excited to explore and might have been the scene that a number of more um, conventional um, opera goers might have had the, the most challenge with because you really saw the scene from one point of view depending on where your car was. You either saw a lot of, um, of in this case, Hagen and Alvaric sort of appeared on the other side of this chicken wire um, or you really saw the, the piece from, uh, from, uh, from uh, Albrecht's perspective and Hagen became this person on the other end of the wall or the other side of this wall. And that to me is something I'm really, I, I've been fascinated by with, uh, with projects I've done here in LA with the industry, this notion that um, the audience has a very uh, fixed, has, has a very uh, set perspective that is not a totalizing perspective. There isn't a sense of a complete picture like you would get in a proscenium theater, but instead a kind of perspective on the story. And depending on where you are, your perspective is naturally skewed, but also not any better or worse than anybody else's, but just uh, an independent and individual experience of this piece. And that's something I want to keep exploring um, with site-specific projects that, that I'm imagining for Detroit and for LA. As you drive through, we also had, uh, the, the next thing that you saw was um, uh, chalk, uh, this kind of chalk graffiti on the walls of the uh, of the parking structure, uh, which depicted all of the, the the characters that had had passed away in the ring up till now, which has a significance later. And then we get to the Rhine maidens. Uh, we had a uh, in one brief scene uh, again seven or eight minutes of music. We had both the Rhine maidens and uh, <laughs> Siegfried's death all in one very quick thing. So it was it moved quite quickly. In this case, we had the um, really magnificent. Um, uh, Indian uh, tenor Sean Panikar, Indian American uh, uh, tenor Sean Panikar, who lives in uh, lives in Michigan, which was one of the amazing uh, uh, amazing opportunities of this, is is really thinking as much as possible who is close by uh, to Detroit that we can bring in. And uh, Sean was only forty five minutes away, uh, and uh, and sang the roles just so 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 beautifully. Um, we had his death scene as part of this, a brief moment with the Rhine Maidens. Normally this is about an hour's worth of music and it, it was condensed to about eight um, in our case. Um, they, uh, the audience was then um, led by a hearse, which took them to this next scene of a funeral march. Um, oh, I forgot to mention, sorry. The, in the previous scene, the Rhine Maidens, the instruments for the Rhine Maidens were marimba, vibraphone, uh, violin, um, oh dear, two other instruments, two other more, maybe more more, uh, more um, conventional instruments um, supporting them. But the marimba and vibraphone added this fantastic, as Ed's a brilliant idea to create this kind of uh, underwater texture uh, for the Rhine Maidens. And it, it, it worked so, it just so beautifully. Um, in uh, in this case, we have the funeral march uh, again. Now now it's Siegfried's name that is that is chalked all over the parking center, and this became a kind of a um, a, a light uh, a light show that was accompanied by a uh, re a re a reimagining re of, of the, the, this incredibly famous piece of of, uh, of music. Uh, the, the 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 funeral march was put into a kind of a Motown. Um, uh, Motown ensemble by the composer Louis Pesikov, uh, who created also these interstitial audio tracks so that as you're moving from scene to scene on your FM radios, there was never a, a drop in continu sonic continuity uh, in a way. There, were, there was always some, some sound, but he was kind of leaning on for earlier tracks um, pieces like the Walter Carlos switched on box. So there'd be these heavily synthesized uh, redoings of, of Wagner that then in this case kind of um, had its ap apotheosis in uh, a Motown version of, of the funeral march, which was just so thrilling. And uh, I'm looking forward to sharing this, this, this track uh, with the world, I hope in the new year. And when you got to this, um, uh, at the end of the funeral march, you met Erda. Erda in our case was the Detroit based poet, Marsha Music. And she had played a really important role all the way through this piece. At this point in the parking center, you're just about at the roof, uh, but now you meet Erda live. Erda does not appear in Goethe Demelon normally, but um, uh, Marsha um, actually kind of spoke the role of, uh, of a kind of an Erda 
telling the whole story of Goethe Dämmerung um, in her own words as a uh, in, in rhymed couplets. And we actually heard her voice all the way through the piece. It actually connected all of the various scenes. And now at this point, we finally uh, arrive at her own voice and, and seeing her um, um, speak, this, uh, speak this text that she wrote. And then finally, we arrive at the top and we see Brunhilde uh, played by the uh, magnificent soprano, Christine Gerke. She was surrounded by, let me see, this next picture gives you a little bit of a better picture. Um, she was surrounded by burnt out cars that we rented um, from, a, uh, from, a, from, a, from a junkyard. Um, probably no one cares why we had to rent them, but I thought it was kind of funny that we had to rent the cars, uh, even though they were destroyed. Um, so she was surrounded by these destroyed cars uh, that, that, were, that caught on fire. In this scene, she sets fire, uh, she, she jumps on Siegfried's funeral pyre and sets herself on fire. And that's the fire that destroys her father's palace. In the background, you saw the theater. Here you see Detroit Opera House, uh, but it was separated through this concrete. And from this wreckage, um, she, instead of a horse, instead of Grana uh, being uh, a horse as it is in the, in the, in the libretto, um, our horse was a Ford Mustang, which is a, a car that has, uh, has a long history uh, with the city of Detroit and manufactured in the city of Detroit. And in many ways also stands in as the symbol of a kind of American, uh, American, I don't know how to put it. It's, it's, it's a great symbol. Let's put it that Wild. way. Yeah, exactly. That's right, but uh, it was quite it was quite beautiful. And Ford, you know, is is a, is a, has been a major supporter of the opera um, throughout its life, and it was really great uh, of them to lend us this ten millionth um, <laughs> ten millionth model of the of the Mustang. Uh, of course, it had to be a uh, convertible because that's part of the iconography, I think, of this car. But um, but you know, around these destroyed cars, uh, with the backdrop of Detroit behind her. Right on cue, this Ford Mustang swung into view uh, uh, and uh, drove her off uh, into the into the future, so to speak. So this 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 pristine and shining, beautiful new car um, around all this wreckage, uh, I think, helped convey this message of it of it being, um, in a way, a spirit of a kind of of, of a kind of hope, you know, um, and and a joy um, uh, in in thinking about the future. And she led off the audience as they went down and they, they went down the, the, this kind of other side of the helix of the, of the parking center and they heard the final track in their ears. And, um, and that was it. Um, so that was what the experience ended up being. Uh, thank you for, I mean, taking us for this journey uh, in this journey through, through the, the work. Um, I also have, I have other questions, of course, but I will give uh, Luis the opportunity to jump in. I, I know he has um, also uh, some very interesting questions. So please, Luis. Yeah. Hi, Yuval. Thank you so much for that very uh, clear, clear presentation of, of, of the opera. Um, I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little about what it's like moving between these to opera world's production, so to speak, the more experimental one that you had in LA, and the other ones. Um, I'm thinking particularly at, at, at your work at Bayreuth. Um, yes. The more conventional one, so to speak, or at least in the more conventional venues. Um, yeah. And also, how, how do you manage that, and how do they connect? And and also, um, if you, if the time that you spent in Europe, you had a chance to, um, if you could give us your idea of the differences or the similarities between nowadays opera mm -hmm. productions, both in the US and both in Europe. Yeah, I mean, th there's a lot to unpack there. So I'll yeah. uh, maybe just brief, I'll, I'll, I'll say briefly that uh, first to your later point, I really hope that this uh, pause, uh, at, at MOT, they, they like calling it an intermission. <laughs> you know, while we're all uh, we're all waiting for what's next, I sincerely hope that um, what comes after does not resemble what took place before. I think this is an amazing opportunity to really rethink the genre, really rethink how we produce opera, what stories we tell, what composers do we highlight, who's directing, who's conducting. Uh, who's in the audience, all of these 
all of these questions, I think we now have a mandate to answer in a way that maybe maybe has always been a little bit on the back burner while business as usual kind of happened. I think in America, if we go back to the opera house and it, and it looks and, and feels and sounds like it did before the pandemic, we will have lost a tremendous opportunity, I think, uh, for change and transformation. And I think Europe, you know, Europe uh, obviously has um, went back to live performance again for a while and was shut down again. So um, I, I think that, um, you know, I'm curious how it's going to, how, how this will impact um, live performance in Europe. I have the feeling it's, I have the feeling the impact in America is gonna be much greater because we've been basically uh, uh, relegated to, to mostly digital fair, you know, up until now. And, and certainly through the next six months, it's gonna be almost entirely digital uh, presentations. Uh, while people try to make sure they stay connected to their audience and the artists keep working. So, um, you know, um, so it's, I think that I certainly hope that the impact will be, will be uh, really significant in America. In Europe, because the tradition is so much deeper and richer and longer, <laughs> um, I have the feeling that, that, um, that it's going to be much harder for that ship to turn, you know, um, and, and I, I do, even the projects that happened in the pandemic, you got the sense that it was similar to the kind of things that you saw pre-pandemic. You didn't, I mean, when I look at the pictures from the Salzburg Festival, you know, they were clearly the projects that they were, that they would have, that they would have done anyway, I think, you know, um, and, and that might've been very uh, reassuring and encouraging for audiences that made it to Salzburg to see those performances. And they certainly did it quite well. No one got sick during those performances. So, so they showed that there was a way. Similarly in Detroit, nobody got sick during our, 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 our performances. So that was, uh, I think a real success of the, of the project. But I hope that Twilight Gods shows to my, certainly my, my American colleagues that, um, that, you know, we never would have done a project like that if it wasn't for the pandemic. And yet um, uh, it would have been worth doing anyway. It would have been worth doing it in a normal year. It would have been worth do doing it even if we were producing as usual. So um, so I, um, uh, I'm excited about that, that transformation. Um, in terms of for me personally working in, 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 in different modes, you know, I have to say that my heart certainly lies much more with the kind of experimental work. Um, but I, I feel that opera, what is so great about opera is its connection to tradition, its connection to history. Um, that, so that even as we're transforming the world of opera, I hope, you know, even as we are really radically changing it, I think we should always keep an eye on where, we're, where, where we've come from and what shoulders we're standing on. Um, and that's actually, that's actually a very exciting balance. And, and it, it, there's a lot of tension in that balance, but I think it's a very fruitful tension, you know? Um, um, and I, uh, I think doing projects in Europe like the Lohengrin and Bayreuth or Magic Flute in Berlin, or, you know, these, these more traditional titles in much more traditional settings um, were incredibly valuable opportunities for me to engage with that history and to think about what it means to move that history forward. I, uh, I think that there is, um, I think it's a lot more difficult. And um, in some cases, sometimes I think I'm not, I'm not sure I'm the right person for that kind of that, that kind of thing. But I uh, uh, but it was an incredibly valuable aspect of uh, of my of my own experience as I as I, you know, as I try to think about how uh, what the future of opera is. And I think for me personally, the pandemic has made me feel much more committed to trying to make opera meaningful in America where I think not just because of the pandemic, but because of everything, I think there's, there's, there, there are tremendous opportunities for, for change here. Um, and so, um, so I, you know, I, like everyone, we've all been upended by, by, by current events, but I think in my case, my, this, this is, this has reminded me that, that um, as much as I, as, as, as much as I love going to Europe and working in Europe, there's, um, there's a lot to be done here. Um, and I, I, I sense, I, I sense a more more of a commitment to 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 doing things in this in this country. Um, I'd like to ask a second question, which, which I think makes sense um, in the wake of what you have just said, uh, and in a way it it somehow goes in the different direction um, uh, of my first question. Uh, but in the end, I think they actually uh, make sense together. So on the one hand, there seems to be this affinity, these let's say. Air de famille, 
uh, between um, this production, uh, Twilight Gods, mm -hmm. and your previous productions with the industry. Uh, mm -hmm. However, there's also a huge difference because with the industry, you were staging newly or recently created works, whereas this right. time with Twilight Gods, you are staging Wagner's Demo, right? So we are proposing a radical adaptation, which is also an abridged version sung in English uh, with the different instrumentation of this very yeah. well-known opera. So against this background, I, 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 would, I would like to ask my question in relation to something you said a few weeks ago uh, in a conversation with David Levine, Gundula Kreutzer and mm -hmm. Kirsten Page. Um, I think you were talking about this notion of opera being an unsettled art form. Mm -hmm, uh, which mm -hmm. for you means that opera doesn't imply a pre-established harmony between different arts. Um, so in light of Twilight Gods, I, I wonder whether the pandemic is leading us to take a step further and acknowledge not only the unsettledness of opera as an art form, but mm -hmm. also questioning the boundaries of what it means to stage an opera, a pre-existent opera, not only with regard of uh, to what is seen on stage or mm -hmm. to how the story is interpreted, which has been done quite frequently, but also right. in terms of how it sounds uh, to the point yes. that perhaps the notion of how far a staging and the stage director can go in rereading or reinterpreting a pre-existent work is also being challenged. Yeah, I mean, that was for me the, 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 real, uh, the real experiment with Twilight Gods was, as you said, not, not uh, starting from scratch and making everything kind of bespoke to the, to the, to the moment and to the location, uh, but instead thinking, okay, here is, uh, he, here is a pre-existing work. Um, mm -hmm. I think in, in America, especially in theater, you, you, there's a lot of discussions. I think in Germany too, I mean, you, you hear about this, but it's but I think they have a different answer to this. The, this idea, well, in Germany, the word is Werktreue, which is like how, how, uh, uh, how, you know, what's your responsibility to the work? You know, what's your responsibility to bring the work to life? Um, and I think there's lots of different attitudes about what that means. Um, we don't quite have the same terminology is as as Merk Toya. So I'll just use that as a as a catchphrase for this. Um, I think in in America we've had this feeling that that to be true to the work means you you present it exactly how the composer originally intended over and over and over again, hundreds of years down the line. Maybe little things might change, like the color of a costume or you know um, the lighting might be different. Or you know, even if you modernize it, uh, you might modernize it, but you know, in the S in the end, it always still feels the same. You know what I mean? Like the you know the, the quality of it hasn't changed at all. And um, I, I've been thinking a, I've been thinking a lot about how to be still totally true to the spirit of the work, even if you are transforming the letter of the work. You know, um, uh, the 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 literalness of the work. Um, and again, maybe leaving that window open to the contingencies of the moment, which is what we did with Twilight Gods, that the moment in Detroit with these artists, with this location required us to adapt it. I mean, we would be foolish to say, we are gonna do Goethe Demeron exactly the way it's written. I mean, that would be a complete uh, uh, catastrophe. Um, it would be a kind of a, uh, you know, Fitzcarraldo type uh, undertaking, you know, which could only result in a, <laughs> In, in, in bad things happening, I think. Yeah, so, but the, um, yeah, let me interrupt you just to make it a yeah, bit please. more dynamic. The, uh, the answers to that challenge could, are, could be very different. For instance, there was a, yes. a Boris Godunov by Koski where uh, the orchestra and the chorus, they were playing uh, somewhere else. So it was a yes. different answer. And, I'm, and in that case, uh, the music was exactly the same. Whereas in your production, you you took a, 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 different, a, a different option and you just yep. Yep. restructured the very opera in terms of uh, the length, the instrumentation. Mm -hmm. So, and that I think it's yeah. uh, challenging and could be something that will have consequences after the pandemic. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. You know, I'd like to think about it in connection with I think, I think what resonates certainly with American audiences, I'm not sure if this will uh, resonate as much with, with, I think it will, with European audiences, but like I, I think about Shakespeare a lot, you know, I think about how Shakespeare is performed 
in uh, in America, actually, and, and more even in, in Europe, where um, where it's in translation anyway, right? In America, we we're still it's, it's English, and so you know we still do feel a lot of fidelity to the uh, to the language. Um, but in translation, when I see Shakespeare productions in in Europe, you know, I, I actually in even in America, I have to say, I can't think of the last time I've seen Hamlet uncut. You know, um, King Lear without cuts, without adaptations, without you know different characters. You know, like a, you know ca that casting, that the size of an ensemble, that all of that isn't totally and 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 in, in some cases really radically transformed to bring out a strand of that play. And I think you can do that with Shakespeare because you feel like, well, Hamlet's not going anywhere. You know, King Lear isn't going anywhere. It's going to be adapted a million times. It, it is, a, you know, it no matter what you do, you're never going to destroy it. You know, you're never going to, or people might think you're destroying it, but, uh, but you actually are it because as someone else will do it uh, even a year later and they'll bring another fresh perspective to it. And this notion that what we're offering uh, from a directorial point of view, what we're offering is not some kind of um, ultimate final final iteration of any of these works. And that that's actually what makes opera so thrilling. And um, is this notion that you're offering a perspective on the work and being honest about the fact that you're, what you're offering is a perspective and not some sort mm -hmm. of, um, you know, some sort of end, like the ultimate production of, this, you know, there, that doesn't exist. You know, Peter Brook said that um, in, in his in, in his book, the, the Empty Space, and it, that really resonated with me when I read that right? when I read that kind of attitude towards Shakespeare or towards towards theater. This notion that um, we're always um, the, the the flux of time is transforming our experience of these works, um, whether we want to admit it or not. So I think we should really uh, not just admit it, but embrace it and say that the times require us to rethink some of these things. And, and uh, you know, good to them isn't going away. You know, uh, I'm not sure if Detroit, you know, Detroit is, is a kind of a mid-sized company, you know, so I don't, I don't know, I don't know if we'll ever do a full ring cycle with the full orchestra and all of that anyway. Um, but, you know, the Met will again, you know, uh, European opera companies will do it again. Um, other, you know, major companies in, in America will do it. Um, and I hope that the people that saw Twilight Gods, when they sit in a theater and watch a more uh, standard production of Goethe Dämmerung, and they hear the Hagen Albrecht scene with the normal orchestra, you know, the fact that they've heard it once sitting in a parking lot, mm -hmm. looking through this grate and hearing it with those three ghostly instruments, Will completely change the way that they uh, that they uh, that they that they interpret that piece for themselves. Mm -hmm. So I, I I think that notion that we should absolutely embrace the contingency of of the moment because that to me is the oh, yeah. that to me is the heartbeat of theater, and and opera and, and by extension also opera. You know, it's that notion in America. You know, opera can be very. Uh, it can still be too close to museum, you know, to, to the world of museum instead of the world of theater in terms of the, the flux of time in terms of the moment, in terms of the sense of capturing the moment. And so I, I think that something like Twilight Gods using standard, a standard repertoire piece like Goethe Demelung, I think brings that point home even more in a way than, than, than doing a piece that is uh, from the ground up like I do for the industry. Thank you so much. But I should say I can yeah. I I I intend to do to to do both because I feel like they they inform each other so much, you know. Um, yeah, um, no so I'm I'm still I'm I'm still involved, you know, I'm still artistic director of the industry as well because there are there are experiments that I can undertake here that I I think um, could generate ideas for Detroit and vice versa, you know. This is it's it's a it's a it's a dialogue between these two modes of of, of thinking, I think. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Luis, do you want to ask um, a question before we perhaps open the floor to other people? Well, just just a quick one. Well, it's never a quick one, but <laughs> yeah, well, I'd like to ask you something uh, more from a, from a composer uh, perspective. Uh, because here in Portugal, I'm a composer, but sometimes I'm also uh, a producer of, of, of other sort of um, less conventional opera presentation. And... Um, I wanted to talk to you about a little bit about Invisible Cities. I remember uh, reading a lot of reviews, but uh, I was I was kind of struck by one one of that reviews uh, that said that the score was inconsequential. The score of Christopher Schroen, meaning that 
uh, any music could have been applied to that performance. Later, a couple of years later, uh, that same critic made a, re a review on the CD of the opera. And mm -hmm. that, that uh, well, he had a change of heart. Sort of thing. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> so uh, my question is, do you think that, that the, the, the music of the opera uh, lost, has, has been losing importance, especially in more experimental works? Because with so much going on, sometimes all the detail of the music can't really be uh, acquired, especially at the first at the first hearing, and that in a conventional place the music would be more appreciated. Um, mm -hmm. And so, it, and this is a sort of a double question. But do you think it's easier to work with a living composer or with a dead composer? <laughs> <laughs> What a, both are both of those are amazing questions. Uh, I'll see if I can I'll see if I can answer more succinctly yeah. to make sure there's time for uh, yeah. for other uh, uh, questions. But um, I vehemently disagree that um, the score was of, of of Chris's opera was 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 inconsequential. I know you I know you were saying that it was a it was a perspective that also changed. But I have to say that. This is why for the industry, we have always released a recording of the music after the production. Um, because, um, uh, and, and we're, we're working on one for Sweetland too. So like this notion that actually the music is still the driving force of everything the industry does, you know? I mean, everything that Chris created is what led me to think about the train station and headphones. And I mean, it's actually, when I talked to him about it, right away and said what about hearing it on head hearing the piece on headphones because it's so quiet and so delicate and um and i think it's been you know it, it's a piece that he actually originally he wasn't sure where it where it would find its home and it was having trouble uh, finding finding a, a more conventional a more conventional home because it doesn't quite fit in a proscenium theater you know but to do it in a place like a train station is an opera that's so much about travel and destinations and kind of imagining destinations um, um, and, and other cities. Um, um, you know, to do it in a train station meant we would have to preserve the intimacy through through headphones, you know, and I talked to Chris about it and he said, I've actually always imagined that this opera would work best with headphones because so much of it is sotto voce or, you know, almost whispered and wants to feel like an internal experience. And so, um, so it actually was a way to, uh, to unlock the music. Now, the the rest of the the rest of the production um the same with hopscotch i think the same with sweetland there were a lot of competing uh th there was a lot of competition for your attention you know it was a very all of these were incredibly layered uh, uh experiences um but i don't think that i don't think that minimized the music i just think it put the music on a more level playing ground with absolutely everything else and probably more than in a normal theater, because you're in you're in, in all of those cases, you're in everyday life, or surrounded by a, uh, and actually Twilight Gods was similar. You know, there was the everyday life of Detroit that you could see through the openings in the parking center. Um, you know, there were there were people still using that parking center on the other side of it. You know, so there was a kind of there was one scene. There was one time we did the performance of Siegfried's um, his death, his 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 final his final uh, kind of monologue just as he's dying and he's and he's dying and singing so beautifully and in the background um the janitor was uh emptying the trash you know uh, all the way in the back because they were just going about their everyday life and that juxtaposition i thought was just so magical um but yes you're it's different from sitting in a contained theater and listening with an almost sole focus on on the music, you know, um, or with with uh, you know the visuals uh, visuals not distracting from your experience of the music. And to me, that just brings opera too close to concert. You know, I love opera in concert. Uh, I think it's a great way to experience um, just the pure music of it. I think more opera should be done just in concert because then when you go in to see an opera in a in a in a theater all of uh, the, the rest of what the opera needs to be, which is the visual experience, the architectural experience, you know, the, 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 um, the, the specific acoustic experience, all of those don't come across as distractions at all, but become a part of the experience, an extension of the music 
you know, an expansion of the original ideas of the composers and librettists. So, so, so I, um, so I, I think that, um, I, I think that because of, because Goethe Demelung was pre-existing, people could lean a little bit more on, on past experiences of, of an opera. And that, that might have made something like Twilight Gods a, a little easier for people to, to um, comprehend on a first go. Um, whereas with Twilight Gods, you're trying to, uh, sorry, with, with something like uh, Invisible Cities or Hopscotch or Sweetland, you're trying to follow the musical argument while also taking in a kind of 360 degree experience. So I, I admit it's, it was a, uh, it was, it was a lot to take in. Um, but I, I don't think that means that the music is therefore minimized. Uh, I wasn't succinct, I'm sorry, but I, and I'm sorry, you had a second question, but I don't know if we should, uh, I see some questions coming in, so I'm not sure if, uh, Yes, there's a question by Elena. So I think uh, you can just turn on um, the, um, the video and ask it. Yeah, thank you very much, Yuval. It's a great pleasure to, to have you here, you here with thank us and, and to discuss. And I'm always extremely curious uh, to hear what comes from your operatic kitchen, <laughs> every new piece. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I, I have kind of two types of comments or questions. Um, for the first group of them, I'm interested in these arrangements that were made in music. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I, you mentioned the name of composer who did mm -hmm. one of them or all of them. And yeah. uh, what was, uh, did you discuss with him uh, what is supposed to be done or he had complete mm -hmm. freedom? And I suppose that the voices uh, were not touched, like uh, you use the, the voices, uh, conventional operatic voices for Wagner's opera. Yes. You didn't want to experiment with any other kind of voice or you thought that in you know, that way, Wagner's opera would lose something of its essence probably. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's such a great question. Um, uh, I, I think that it would have been fantastic to to explore uh, having vocalists from other from other genres come into this to this world, um, especially because we performed the piece in English, so uh, it was even that much more accessible. But I was, I really had to think in this case what again this is how the the pandemic sort of shaped the whole experience was thinking um, something like working with a, a new a new vocalist in this kind of repertoire. What kind of rehearsal and preparation time would that need? And could we do it? Could we do it in this kind of socially distanced way, with everyone on masks and outdoors and far apart from each other? It didn't seem. It seemed like you would want to get close to somebody, and you'd want to you and, and to actually prepare for them properly. It just didn't. It it just seemed like a stretch. And again, part of why I didn't want to do a world premiere, uh, world premiere musical idea, you know, it's, but but actually build on something that's already pre existing. Because um, for someone like Christine, who is sang this role in, in you know, the Met and uh, you know, is, uh, uh, knows it so well, um, we're building off of her um, experience with this role and this character to allow for the whole, uh, the, the, the circumstances for preparing the production to be um, as, as uh, streamlined as we possibly can and as safe as we possibly could. So, so we, we passed on vocalists, but with orchestra was different because we had to reduce it radically anyway, you know? So um, with, uh, so Ed did the live arrangements, Ed Wendells is the name of the, the composer and arranger. And um, I think it was just kind of a conversation that, that the two of us had, you know, um, he had a lot of, he definitely had a lot of freedom. I think we ultimately realized that in the locations where I was uh, putting the scenes, uh, to keep everyone as far apart from each other, we had to kind of limit it to certain numbers, you know? Um, at the very top uh, level for the immolation scene, and, and I didn't talk about this, but it was nine musicians up there because we could really space everybody out um, on that rooftop. So that could be the, the largest uh, number. And even that, that was about as large as we could do it with people far apart, you know, um, and still staying um, together, you know, and still being able to be coordinated. So. Um, 
So I think the numbers, the numbers kind of dictated what we, uh, what we could do also budget wise. I think we ended up realizing, okay, I think we could with, with, uh, with um, Michigan Opera Theater, we said there'll be 18 musicians um, total. So we just worked backwards from the top and said, okay, nine at the top, um, you know, five for the Rhine Maidens and Siegfried, three for uh, Hagen uh, and uh, Albrecht, and then one for uh, for Valtrauta. And so numbers helped, you know, numbers helped us shape that idea too, you know. So um, so it was a, it was a conversation, but he he definitely. Um, I think the only restriction beyond numbers was also really wanting to use as many um, instruments from the Michigan Opera Theater Orchestra as possible, so we could put them to work, you know, and give them some some employment. Um, during this time. So, um, so I think there were two, the, obviously the, 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 the opera orchestra doesn't have an accordion on staff and they don't have an electric bass player on staff, but otherwise, um, otherwise everybody else, you know, we started from the, from the point of view of the, of the orchestra. Okay, thank you. And, and I can't help but to ask uh, another question. Um, as a potential participant in an audience uh, of this opera, um, I'm not a driver, and I refuse to be a driver, not only because I don't like it, I only have the license for the boat, but somehow I don't like to drive the car, and I would not like to be part of that game, so to say. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, from, from the beginning, when you started explaining everything, and I watched the video on the, on the internet, uh, how to use this opera, there is like extensive uh, <laughs> uh, instructions. Yeah, a, lot of, a lot of instructions. Yeah. yeah. Lots of instructions. And I felt yeah. kind of excluded. And also I felt kind of excluded in a way when I was once in Detroit, when I was, I don't know, still a teenager. And again, it was this connection with non-driver's experience because I was somewhere in suburbs of Detroit. And then I decided to take a walk to the mall, but it was a couple of kilometers. And then many, many drivers stopped, like to ask me if everything was okay. Do I need a ride or something? Because it was, I figured out it was very unusual that I walked because it mm -hmm. was not kind of usual experience. And then uh, even before this, I became kind of curious about this automobility experience. And I saw that a couple of theoreticians already wrote books about cultural history of automobility in the United right. States and why uh, modern conception of self is so uh, linked to driving experience in America. What, what do you think about these, uh, this angle of uh, looking into it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'll say that, you know, if, if, we, if we wanted to do this opera in, in Lisbon, we could do it in boats. That sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, <laughs> but uh, Detroit is a car city, as you, as you, as you noted. It's, it's a very, very high. And it's also partial, partially, it's also in the fabric of that city's um, at the heyday of Detroit's uh, of Detroit's history is is in a big part because of the automobile industry that's there. So cars cars have a resonance there, uh, and also an accessibility there that is that is is you know is 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 pretty significant to the to the identity of the um, of the city. And in in that way, it feels like a you know it was easy for me to think about because having done an, an opera in another car city uh, in Los Angeles where people do the same thing that you said, if you're walking in Los Angeles, you get a lot of people stopping and saying, what is wrong with you? <laughs> you know, why are you walking? Um, so um, so it, funny enough, those are it, certainly in LA, I haven't noticed this in Detroit. In LA, people realize that is a um, that is a dead end. You know, it's in terms of the environmental impact, in terms of the waste in terms of um uh in in terms of in terms of so many reasons why i'm guessing you might be against car culture um but that's certainly the present so that's certainly where we currently are um so in this case you know um certainly there was no uh no implication of wanting to exclude anybody uh, and in, in for that reason we also presented a live stream of the piece um uh, the last rotation every for the last two nights we had a camera move through there and people could sit in the opera house um, to watch it, watch the video uh, of, of someone moving through the experience, you know, if they, if they didn't have 
cars, you know, or if they if they didn't want to do that. But actually, the cars under the circumstances was the safest possible way to experience this piece because you are in your own, you are with people you were quarantining with. Um, you, you know, you 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 had zero direct contact with anybody while you w watched this performance. The closest you got to somebody was at the beginning when when uh when you rolled down your window and then some one of the one of the MOT staff with a with a mask on would just make sure that you understood all of the you're right very very long directions to uh <laughs> to to figure this out but i think it's i think it's using in a way the the vernacular of the city and i i think that's a very exciting path for opera to take is realizing what really makes detroit uh, uh you know what, what what makes detroit what are the what's the iconography of detroit and what's the experience of moving through detroit i can't remember now the the philosopher who kept talking about i thought about it a lot during hopscotch but i, I want to say it's um uh baudrillard but i don't think it's baudrillard but but the notion that that um the experience of always driving in a city like la makes the landscape a kind of cinema you know that there's like the frame of the of the uh windshield uh, turns the entire city into in, into um, into a film, and that of course has a lot of resonance in, in Los Angeles, where where the chief export is uh, is uh, entertainment. Um, but in Detroit, it has a different it has a very different resonance because it's it's also the, a kind of a uh, an, an aspect of of the actual uh, manufacturing of that city. So so um, so I think about it a lot. You know, it, it's certainly not. Um, I think hopscotch too was by by no means a kind of praise of car culture. Um, um, it was meant to actually walk that that unstable line between the, the notion of mobility and then also the isolation and loneliness of being trapped in these metal uh, uh, metal uh, vessels, you know, separate from your community and the, the alienation that that actually creates in the community. But that it's it's both. It's not one thing or another. You know, it's not it's not overly critical and it's not, um, it's certainly not in any way celebratory, but it's, it's an experience with all of that connected to it. Thank you. So we have uh, two questions now, one by Rajika and one by uh, Nicholas Stevens, who actually wrote it down, but I will give the floor to Rajika, please. Thank you. Um, actually, I was interested to know the makeup of the people who came uh, to these, uh, shows because I, I, I worked with that, I think probably 260 per show. And uh, so there was quite a large number of people. And given this thing of, you know, it being a city of, of lots of African Americans and of Motown kind of music, and uh, not quite Wagner, what was the makeup of it is my first question. And then after that, I have a question about the future of, of what you're going to do for them to, because if I see, very deliciously on the website, there's more coming. <laughs> yes, yes. As a director. As director. Yes, well, I mean, to the, to the, yeah, to the first question, um, I was very intrigued because I, I'm still getting to know Detroit. So I was so curious as to who is, who is, who is going to come and also how are they going to respond? Uh, so I was, I was really happy to see that, uh, uh, it, it turned out that 50% of the audience was new to MOT. They had never seen a show at the Opera House before. Um, so that was, um, it was a lot of new people, you know? And I think that the demographics also were, were quite wide ranging. I think it was a lot of people that were very specific to the city of Detroit. Um, Detroit also being an 82% African-American city, um, you know, means that it's, it's a city in which that, the, the black experience is, uh, is, is very, very present and, um, and, uh, and, a, and a huge part of the makeup of, of that city. Um, so it was, it was exciting to see that a piece like this um, definitely woke up some new, some new interest in, in, the, in the opera, um, um, in the community. And I, I definitely feel that everybody, everybody that's part of MOT noticed, you know, and saw, okay, we need to be doing more kind of works like this alongside, you know, classic works, but let's, let's also make sure that there is a, a healthy amount of these kind of explorations um, that we can, that we can, um, that we can share to also, yeah, to, 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 to really open. And, oh, I should say one other thing. The thing that really excited me even more than that, because I figured that a, that an experience like Twilight Gods would open itself up to new audience members. 
but I was really thrilled that it was the the people that ha, that that uh, identify as kind of dyed in the wool uh, conventional opera lovers, the ones that really you know want to see Bohem the way that that Puccini saw it, you know, um, uh, the, that loved the standard repertoire, that they loved it too. I mean, that was a real exciting aspect of it for me was that the audience, um, the audience that I might have figured might have said, this isn't Wagner, this is, you know, what, what a desecration of, uh, of this holy music, you know, that there was nothing like that at all, uh, that there was an incredible enthusiasm um, for the kind of spirit of adaptability and, and ingenuity that they, that they, that they recognized in, 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 in the piece. So I, um, so I, that, that, that was, that was for me very encouraging that it, it, it was something in which, um, you know, I, I should say, I, I kind of, I kind of just want to have it all in this way. You know, I want everyone to come along, you know, I want to create pieces that everybody uh, can join in on, you know, from people that are um, fascinated by, uh, the 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 orchestral textures you know there there are things that are that not everyone's going to immediately recognize but I also think that's wonderful to create a piece that has so many um, access points you know that anybody could get into it um, and that even for people who truly love Wagner and Goethe Demelung that there's a lot for them to get out of this experience you know that it isn't just it just it isn't uh, it, the bar isn't set low it's quite the opposite the bar is set extremely high. But it, that doesn't that doesn't exclude anybody except for maybe uh, Yelena's point. Uh, you you do need to have a car, <laughs> but but otherwise, you know, the work itself does not does not exclude anybody. And I, I feel like that that point um, that point really um, came through. Uh, I, there's a question by Nicholas Stevens, which I think is really worth um, reading because he went to the production um, and he says, in the experience of taking a road trip to get to Detroit and avoid contact with others along the way, heighten the sense of apocalyptic, apocalyptic circumstances in both the piece and the world outside. Yet there was so much humor and even camp. And Christine smiled at me while emulating. Uh, how did you manage to keep a tongue in cheek or a lighter tone while producing this that serious opera under deadly serious conditions? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I th I have to say here that I um, uh, I was um, Achim Fryer's assistant on the ring cycle that was presented here in Los Angeles. It's actually what brought me to Los Angeles um, was assisting him on that on that cycle. And you know, I, if you look at pictures, you'd think there's nothing in common between what I what I'm doing and what Achim does. But um, I learned a lot from Achim and. Um, uh, one of the things I learned from him is that, and, and if you've seen, if you've seen any of his productions, you know, somehow it is taking an indirect approach to the work that actually allows the depth to speak more powerfully, you know, that there is a sense that humor um, doesn't belittle the work in any way, but actually just allows it to take off the pressure so that the piece can speak even more strongly. And I think that that was something that, that just felt that I don't know. It, 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 part of it might just be my own personality, but part of it is also just feeling like actually the way to, you know, um, let me put it this way. I I think, and something I've learned from Achim was that you know, contra in in a world like opera, you know, you don't want um, to layer similarities. You want to create contrast, and you want to create. Um, this idea that harmony is a harmony between differences. You know, it's, it's not monotony. It's not everyone singing the same note. It's everyone singing a different note that nevertheless creates something quite beautiful um, that, that harmonizes with each other. But in that, that also includes dissonances, you know, um, that dissonances can be a way of understanding what's, what's, what's happening. And the idea of uh, introducing humor or lightness, I guess, maybe not humor, because there, there were certainly was nothing to laugh about, but, um, but that that lightness just offered that sense of a, uh, of a contrast and, and to put the, the seriousness in relief so that actually that apocalyptic, um, apocalyptic spirit that was on the streets of Detroit, the streets of, of every American city, um, but, uh, you know, we come to this performance and, and we get that and we experience it in a new way. And yet 
that that sense of lightness is the thing that offers, I think, a window towards hope, you know. Um, and and in the end, Goethe Dämmerung, for all of its heaviness and, and apocalyptic nature, nevertheless ends with a beautiful pan to uh, to Brunhilde, you know, um, that some people have called, uh, you know, it, it, it ends with this theme that we've heard really only one other time in the entire cycle in, in Valkyrie. Um, when Siglinda is praising Brunhilde. And that theme has sometimes been called a kind of hope theme or a love theme or um, who knows what, but actually um, Wagner called it uh, Brunhilde's Verherrlichung. I don't know how to translate that really well. Verherrlichung is like um, I, lifting Brunhilde up on a, you know, like a, a, a really absolutely uh, in praise of Brunhilde. And um, that's how the whole cycle ends with this theme that in the end, um, it, I, I think it's almost too simple to call it like a love theme or a hope theme or a, you know, uh, all of those things. But, but, uh, but instead it's about Brunhilde for being the true hero of the piece. And the only character in the entire opera that thought for themselves, um, that was able to truly um, be a liberating force uh, uh, in, this, in this entire cycle. And the notion of, of this powerful woman, ending with the notion of this powerful woman as, as the key uh, to, to unlocking this kind of dead landscape of Göttingen, um, I think is incredibly, uh, incredibly bright, you know, an incredibly bright uh, image to offer the world. And with that includes a, some lightness, I think. Uh, thank you. I think this is a great way to close our, our conversation. Uh, but before saying goodbye, I want to thank you again for, for being with us today. It was a real pleasure. And also to, uh, for those who, who showed up for participating and asking questions. So thank you so much again. Uh, and see you um, relatively soon, probably next year, uh, in our uh, third Vesh Vesh Opera Conversation. Thank you. Good afternoon and good morning to you, Yuval. Yes, and see thank you. Next you. Time. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you.